Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There once was a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. After he had gone through all his money, there was a bad famine all through the country, and he began to feel it. He signed on with a citizen there who assigned him to his fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry, he would have eaten the corn cobs in the pig slop, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses. He said, All those farm hands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went home to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to the servants. Quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a prize-winning heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive, given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. All this time, his older son was out in the field. When the day's work was done, he came in. As he approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. Calling over one of the servants, he asked what was going on. He told him, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast, killing the fattest calf, because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stomped off in angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, Look, how many years have I stayed here serving you, never giving you one moment of grief, but have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? Then this son of yours who has thrown away your money on whores shows up and you go all out with a feast. His father said, Son, you don't understand. You are always with me, and everything that is mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time and we had to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead, and he's alive. He was lost, and he's found. Elaine did a lovely job reading the story for us. Reading the story of the prodigal son is a bit like reading the story of Christmas or Easter. Before we've even started in, we already know how it's going to end. There's a familiarity with this story. For some of us, it comes from the fact that it's one of the most beloved stories in all of the Bible. As children, we learn from the Old Testament the story of Noah's Ark and David and Goliath. And from the New Testament, we learned about the boy who gave his few loaves and fishes to feed 5,000 people and the prodigal son. Always the prodigal son. If we don't know the story from reading the Bible, then we know it from personal experience. In the Bible, this story is often titled The Prodigal Son, with a capital P on prodigal and a capital S on son, as if there was only ever one and this is the one. But we know that The Prodigal Son could be the soundtrack for many of our lives. Many of us have had them or have them. Many of us have been them or are them. Many of us have known them or know them. And it doesn't always have to be a son. 
Why, just yesterday, I was out in the yard visiting with my neighbor when he said, ah, look, the prodigal has returned. I looked over to my shoulder to see who he was referring to. It was a cat. When I asked why he called the cat a prodigal, my neighbor said, it's a stray. It only comes around when it's hungry. But is it your cat? I asked. I guess, my neighbor said, I feed him. In my Bible, the title of the story is not The Prodigal Son, but The Prodigal Son and His Brother. Though I'm not sure that's going far enough. Maybe it should be The Prodigal Son and His Brother and Their Father and Their Cat. For to be a prodigal is to acknowledge that we are relational beings. We are products of one another and of the systems family, political, economic, church, and otherwise, that we share. Consider the details of the story. It begins, there was a man who had two sons. This is not a story about just one person, but two. Now this is an important detail because in just a few moments, we're going to meet the younger of the two sons, who is going to ask for his share of the family inheritance so that he can go out and find himself. Asking for the inheritance while his father is still alive is not just a disruption to the family system. It's also a way of saying, I don't want to be part of this family anymore. I want to be known for being me and me alone. But we'll have to see how that goes. Because the younger brother cannot change how the story begins. His father has two sons. He has a brother. And this means that if he is going to go out and find himself, he is going to have to include both his brother and his father in his search. But for the moment, his father is going to let him have what he wants. We will not have to wait long to see how this will go, because whether we've read the story or not, We all know what happens when we go looking for and find our Christmas presents early. We suffer disappointment. Not because we aren't getting what we want. Maybe we find there in the back of the closet, hidden behind the coats, everything we want and more. But somehow, we still feel disappointed by it. And this is because true joy comes not in the looking or the finding or the asking, but in the receiving. How nice it can feel to ask a parent while standing in the checkout line at the grocery store, standing at the candy, can I have that? But how much better when they ask us, would you like that? But the prodigal will not give his father time to ask this question. He beats him to it, asking, no, demanding, father, Give me my share of the inheritance now. A couple weeks later, and already he has nothing left. He's wasted it all. Sleeping with the pigs, the boy who was given everything he asked for now has nothing he needs. Crawling his way back home, his tail between his legs, his father sees him while he is still a long way off. He runs to him, kisses him, and calls for a party. I mean, a real party. A go out and buy a new suit, call the caterers and strike up the band kind of party. My son is home. He's got nothing to show for but his raggedy old self, but he's home. And isn't that worth a party? I don't know. Is it? What's your standard for a party? When the older brother gets wind of what's going on, he can't believe it. A party? For that idiot? He took everything our parents worked for and spent it on women and wine. And I've been out in the field all day and no one even came out to find me to tell me to come in because my brother was home. Our father should teach him a lesson, not throw him a party. Some people will celebrate anything but I find there are certain things I cannot. What about you? What's your standard for a party?
The scriptures tell us repeatedly that there are some things God cannot celebrate, like the death of the wicked. In Exodus, the Israelites have their back against the wall. Egypt is coming for them when, mercifully, God parts the waters of the Red Sea so that they can pass through and on to the other side safely. The Egyptians, on the other hand, get drowned alive. Over on the other side, the Israelites, who see the whole thing happen, start popping champagne and cheering and jumping up and down until God steps in to say, What are you doing? Do you not know that though they are wicked, they are my children too? There are just some things that God will not celebrate. How about you? What's your standard for a party? A couple days ago, we gathered in the sanctuary at the church for a funeral. It was the funeral of a woman who died very tragically and very suddenly. Her mother, a woman named Barbara, had taken and brought her daughter back home here to Rhode Island. She had lived and died down in Florida, but in bringing her back here, her mother said it was like bringing her home. Following the service on that day, I stood at the back of the sanctuary greeting people as they left. This is my typical custom. And just about everyone who had come to the funeral that day seemed to be either a family member, a cousin, an aunt, or a close family friend. But there was this one woman who, I asked, who when I asked how she was connected to the deceased, said, I'm afraid I didn't know her. Well, did you know any of the family members, I asked? No, I don't know anyone here, she told me. But when I heard about this woman's death and how she died, I wanted to come. I figured there would be plenty of people here, but I just didn't want the family to be alone. At Four Corners Community Chapel, we don't really call a funeral a funeral. Look at the front of the bulletin cover for any of the services and you'll see that it reads a service of remembrance and in celebration of the life of. But I don't know. I think it's hard to think of a funeral as a celebration, let alone a party. But standing at the back of the sanctuary a couple days ago and hearing this woman describe her reasons for having come to the funeral, I can't say that I didn't feel something like joy rising within me. What's your standard for a party? In his book, Can You Drink the Cup? Author Henry Nowen tells the story of going to the hospital one day to visit his friend Trevor. Trevor was a young man who lived at the Larche Daybreak community, a community for mentally handicapped adults in Toronto, where Nowen, a renowned thinker, scholar, and spiritualist, served as resident pastor for many years. I called the hospital chaplain and I asked if I could come visit Trevor. He said I was welcome to come and he wondered if it would be all right if he invited some of the ministers and priests in the area, as well as some of the hospital staff, to come and have lunch with me while I was there at the hospital. Without thinking much about the implications of his request, I said immediately, sure, that will be fine. When I arrived at 11 a.m., a large group of hospital and personnel staff was waiting for me, and they welcomed me warmly. I looked around for Trevor, but he wasn't there. So I said, I came here to visit Trevor. Can you tell me where I can find him? The hospital chaplain told me, you can see Trevor after lunch. I was stunned and said, but didn't you invite him for lunch? No, no, he told me. That's impossible. Staff and patients never have lunch together. Moreover, we have reserved the golden room for this occasion, and no patient has ever been allowed in the golden room. It is for staff only. Well, I said, I will only have lunch with you all when Trevor can be here too. Trevor and I are close friends. It is for him that I came, and I'm sure he would love to join us for lunch. I noticed some mixed reactions to my words, but after some whispering, I was told that I could bring Trevor with me to the Golden Room. I went to find him and found him on the hospital grounds, as always, looking for flowers. 
When Trevor saw me, his face lit up, and he ran to me as if we had never been apart. Henry, he said, here are some flowers for you. Together we went to the golden room. The table was beautifully set and about 25 people were gathered around it. Trevor and I were the last to sit down. After the opening prayer, Trevor walked to the side table where there were different drinks laid out. Wine, soft drinks, and juices. He said, Henry, I want a Coke. I poured him a Coke, took a glass of wine for myself, and returned to the table. People were making small talk. Many of the guests were strangers who were trying to get to know each other, and the general atmosphere was quiet. I got quickly involved with a conversation with my neighbor on the right and didn't pay much attention to Trevor. But suddenly, Trevor stood up, took his glass of Coke, lifted it, and said with a loud voice and a big smile, Ladies and gentlemen, a toast! Everyone dropped their conversation and turned to look at Trevor with puzzled and somewhat anxious faces. I could read their thoughts. What in the heck is this patient going to do? Better be careful. But Trevor had no worries. He looked at everybody and said, Lift up your glasses. And then, as if it were the most obvious thing to do, he began to sing. When you're happy and you know it, lift your glass. When you're happy and you know it, lift your glass. When you're happy and you know it, when you're happy and you know it, when you're happy and you know it, lift your glass. As he sang, people's faces relaxed and started to smile. And soon a few joined Trevor in his song. And not long afterwards, everyone was standing, singing loudly. What's your standard for a party? Luke says that when this prodigal son came home, his father threw him a party, piled the table high with food, called all the neighbors together, and lifted a glass. Personally, I think the boy ought to have been taught a lesson. And the only lesson that I can see being taught here, and I'm being honest with you about this, the only lesson that I can see being taught here is your home. We forgive you. We love you. We are glad to call you one of our own. I don't know. Is that enough for a party? Thanks be to God. Amen. Falling down from underneath my feet Between the black skies and my red eyes I can barely see When I realize I've been let down By my friends and my family I can hear the rain reminding me In the eye of a storm You remain in control in the middle of a war, you got my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of a storm. Mm -hmm. When my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith, I see the future I picture slowly fade away And when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face I find my peace in Jesus' name In the eye of a storm, you remain in control In the middle of the war you got my soul, you alone are the anchor, when my sails are torn, your love surrounds me, in the eye of a storm.
Defender of the oppressed and the orphan, we pray for all your children in our nation and all the nations of the world this day who suffer from poverty, injustice, and fear. Hear the cries of your children, O God. For children who are runaways, prodigals, homeless, in jail. For children who have been institutionalized because they have been categorized. In your tender mercy, protect them and hear their cry, O God. For children young and old who are disabled in mind, body, or spirit, who have lost all hope in believing, or who have had hope stripped away by systems of privilege, in your tender mercy, strengthen and encourage them, and hear their cry, O God. For children who will not have enough food to eat this day, in your tender mercy, give them a seat at the table and daily bread, more than enough daily bread, and hear their cry, O God. For babies born at risk, for children of all ages who are sick, and for those who lack proper medical care, especially pregnant teenagers and fearful mothers and fathers, in your tender mercy, sustain them and hear their cry, O God. For children who are victims of class or race discrimination, who do not have good education, who are victims of drug or alcohol abuse and hopelessness, in your tender mercy give them lives of hope and a future, and hear their cry, O God. For children who have grown to be soldiers, for soldiers who are still children, and for children who daily experience the fear and pain of war and civil strife, and especially for the children of Ukraine and Russia today, in your tender mercy, defend and protect them, and hear their cry, O God. For your children who are still very young, and for the old who wish for younger days, for your children whose names are written upon our hearts, and for us, your own child, hear our prayers of mercy, O God. For we pray this in the name of the child who was born in a manger in Bethlehem, who was raised in the obscurity of Nazareth, who died on a cross while his mother Mary looked on, the one who is your child, O God, our friend and Savior Jesus Christ, who prays with us and teaches us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forevermore. Amen.